Hello everyone, let's get the meeting started. Hello. Welcome everyone to the Toronto Centre uh, Recreational Astronomy Night meeting for July. My name is Paul Markov, I'll be your host this evening introducing the uh, speakers. And uh, hello to our YouTube viewers. Um, tonight we have uh, four speakers instead of the usual three because uh, some of these presentations are going to be slightly shorter so I didn't want to send you home too early. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we have uh, the sky this month, as usual, uh, starting first, uh, presented by Andy Beaton, uh, followed by Frank Dempsey, uh, who will talk to us about uh, Oumuamua uh, and implications for the origin of life on Earth. Uh, Ron McDonald will uh, follow with uh, Dance of the Red Planet. And finally, uh, we have the NAF family. And uh, they'll talk to us about modeling the deep sky network from Earth to outer space. So, uh, I think we're all set to go. Um, do we have any new members or people here for the first time? Show of hands, please. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hope to see you at future meetings. And uh, I'll pass it over to Andy for the sky this month. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Right. I got the instructions on how to do this and promptly forgot them. Hi. Um, before I start, uh, I'd like to point out this uh, excellent fashionable shirt I'm wearing, uh, available from uh, John up there at the back uh, after the meeting for a modest sum. Um, you can be guaranteed to be the coolest kid on the block. So uh, here we go for the sky this month. What we have on the agenda tonight, uh, the big picture, the planets, the moon, a mission nebula, because I like talking about deep sky stuff, comets and meteors, obviously a variable star. Uh, Blake isn't here, so uh, I'm just going to delete that entire double star for Blake's slide. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, whatever's coming up in space flight for the next uh, month. So the big picture, here we go. This is what the sky looks like tonight, more or less at sunset. We've got uh, a parade of planets uh, heading off to uh, the horizon there. Uh, Venus, uh, Jupiter, the moon, obviously. Uh, Ceres, if you've got a good pair of binoculars or a small telescope. Uh, we can see uh, Ursa Major and uh, Bote's uh, sliding down into dusk. There we go. Okay, here we go. Venus, the moon, Jupiter. Now we can see uh, uh, Scorpius down there in the south. If we stay up uh, all night and see what we can see in the morning, then we've got uh, more planets. We've got Saturn, Mars, Neptune, Uranus. We've got uh, Sagittarius and uh, all the rest of our... Uh, um, ecliptic uh, equi constellations coming along there. We're past the uh, the summer solstice, so the nights are getting a bit longer. It's uh, bad news for days at the beach, but good news for us. We get to uh, get a bit more astronomy in at night. Um, this week, uh, twilight starting pretty close to finishing pretty close to eleven and uh, starting up just a bit after three in the morning. So you know, a solid four hours of observing. Um, by the next meeting, it'll be an hour earlier in the evening and just about an hour later in the morning. So get uh, up to six hours of observing then. 
important dates coming up. Uh, the new moon on August 11th. Uh, also notice right there, beside the new moon, we also have the Perseid meteors coming on August 13th, nice and close together. There is an eclipse of the moon coming up on July 27th. Um, as usual for these things, it's on the wrong side of the Earth. But uh, since we're being broadcast over the internet here, I'm going to uh, point it out anyway. Um, it's possible some of our viewers somewhere are going to be in position to see it or some of us will be traveling and be able to uh, get a glimpse of it. Um, July 27th, uh, the moon is as far as away as it's going to get, as close again on August 10th. Uh, because we have new people here, I'll point out what I always point out. It's a fun uh, project to take a picture of the moon at uh, both of these times, and then compare the size of the two. You can see how much closer and further away the moon gets. Uh, July 31st, uh, Mars will be at its closest. Um, August 11th, we get another partial solar eclipse. And once again, this year being what it is, uh, it's nowhere around here. But if you're traveling, it'd be a, a thing to worth, worth looking for. I wouldn't travel to see it, but if you're there, worth having a look for it. And uh, now that we're in the middle of the summer, uh, now is when all the big star parties come along. Um, I know Starfest up at uh, Mount Forest is uh, the big one around here, but there's a lot of other ones, mostly listed in the back of your observer's handbook. If you want to have a look there, I recommend uh, everybody go to at least one star party in their life. It's a worthwhile experience. So the moon, uh, first quarter, in a couple days, um, full moon, July 27th, good time to get out of town, do something else. Uh, last quarter, August 4th, and the new moon, August 11th, and that's going to be a big one uh, because of the meteor shower at the same time. Um, the next lunar X will be 2.15 a.m. on July 20th. Um, I debated whether or not to include this uh, slide or not, because everybody who's seen my presentation before has seen it, but fortunately we have some new people here. So the Lunar X is a uh, feature, it's an intersection between a couple of craters on the moon, and when the time and the light is exactly right, you get this uh, cool X showing up. Now, scientifically, it's not particularly interesting, but uh, it's a really cool thing to see. And it's also you know, a good incentive to get out with your binoculars or your telescope and actually go out there and take a look and try and find something while it's happening. And as long as you're out there, there are a million other things to see in the night sky. So the planets, we've got uh, Mercury and Venus uh, just after sunset. Right now, Mercury is uh, its very close to uh, setting uh, after the sun. It is still feasible to see it. Um, you need a good horizon. Uh, you need good seeing. Um, you know, hopefully no clouds, but uh, you know, it can be glimpsed with, a, with a, the naked eye if you're very lucky. Um, Venus, you can't miss it. It's the bright thing in the western sky. Um, You'll look to the west and you'll say, that's got to be Venus, and you'll be right. It's no mistaking it for anything else. Look at it with a small telescope, and you'll see it's a half Venus. Uh, it looks like a half moon, only it's a planet. And over the next month, it will be growing bigger as it approaches us. In the morning, we get to... Uh, the big, uh, the big show of uh, Mars, Neptune, and Uranus. Uh, Mars is at its biggest since 2003. I don't know if anybody remembers how impressive it was then. It wasn't really as big as the full moon, but it, it was a big thing in the telescope. Um, the uh, July 31st, uh, the disk is going to be uh, 24 and a bit uh, arc seconds across, which is, which is pretty big. Um, you'll want a telescope to see it, of course, but uh, you know, any kind of telescope, in theory, you should be able to see some features, some of the uh, big dark markings, the polar caps. In practice, 
I was uh, looking at uh, Mars last weekend, and it was just a big dusty mess. It's a giant dust storm season on Mars right now. Uh, hopefully, the dust storms will pass sometime before this uh, this great uh, viewing opportunity goes past us. But uh, you know, our hobby being what it is, uh, no guarantees. Now, as well as uh, looking for all the features on Mars, um, I know everyone's going to be uh, complaining because they're not going to see anything through the dust. There is also the option of uh, looking for the Mars moons, uh, Phobos and Deimos. Um, somebody on the mailing list uh, got a photo of it uh, a couple weeks ago and posted it on Facebook, and I don't remember who it was now, and I'm sorry about that, but it was a uh, a pretty impressive achievement. Um, they'd seen it visually by getting an eyepiece with an occulting bar through the middle to block out the light of uh, Mars. Uh, you can also do it by setting up your telescope beside a building or a post or something that's going to block the light of Mars. And if you're careful, you'll get the uh, one of the moons uh, creeping out uh, before Mars shows up in your viewfinder. Uh, I haven't done it myself. It's on my list of things. Um, it hasn't worked any time I've tried it, but uh, other people have succeeded, so it is a doable thing. So in the middle of the night, we've got the, the big planets, uh, Saturn, Jupiter. Um, Jupiter's the really amazing thing to look at after sunset. It's pretty close. Um, we've got the big, the great red spot there. Now, last year, I was reading that the great red spot may be disappearing forever, and I was suggesting that people you know, keep an eye on it. You know, this could be a scientifically interesting thing. Now, last time I was looking, which was last weekend, the red spot was redder and uh, more obvious than I'd seen it in years. So, you know, scientific predictions are not always uh, what they're cracked up to be. In any case, I would say, you know, get out there and look for it. Um, if you're lucky, you'll see a, a prominent red spot, which is always interesting, and if you see it fading away, then you'll be answering that interesting scientific question. Uh, Saturn is rising in the evening. Um, it's always a good show. Um, it's, the rings are not open at the maximum, but they're good and wide open, and there are lots of moons around it you can see and identify with any kind of planetarium software. Um, Titan is obvious, it's the, the big moon, but there's at least half a dozen others that can be seen with a modest telescope. Pluto, I know it's not a planet, <laughs> is in Sagittarius, and that makes it really tough to find. Um, I don't think I'd even attempt to do it visually. There are so many uh, small stars which are, are easily confused with uh, Pluto. But it would be an interesting photographic uh, target, especially if you can get uh, multiple nights of observation, so you can compare one night to the next and see how the uh, see if you can spot it moving. Ceres, it's uh, close to Venus around now. Um, it's uh, not really much to look at, except for the fact that it is a dwarf planet that you can see and uh, you know, knock it off your checklist. Sadly, all these objects are pretty low in the, uh, towards the horizon from where we live, so they're not going to be amazing photographic targets. But uh, they should be at least interesting visual ones. And yes, it can be done. Um, Mercury is the tricky one. Uh, I saw it last weekend at the, uh, the CAO. And after that, it's just a matter of uh, staying up till 2 or 2 or 30 in the morning. A pair of binoculars is all you need. Remember to look down and count the Earth. And after Mercury, they're all pretty easy. Oh. I just angered somebody. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, shift it. Yeah. 
Okay, we're back. So, um, I always like to uh, suggest some deep sky stuff for people to look at, since we have some uh, some new people here. They may not have seen the, these guys. Emission nebula are the clouds of gas in uh, in space that uh, that glow red as they're uh, illuminated by uh, by stars within them. Um, M8 and M20 in Sagittarius. Uh, the North America Nebula in Cygnus is good. You can see that with binoculars. I probably saw it uh, 50 times before I realized what I was looking at. I thought it was just uh, you know, unclean optics, but uh, it turned out I'd been seeing it. Um, M17, the Swan Nebula or the Omega Nebula, looks more like a duck to me. These are all good targets for binoculars or uh, small telescopes. They're not great for looking at in the city, um, but uh, if you have any kind of nebula filter, that will help out. Uh, my best advice is uh, get out to a star party, even one of the, uh, the small ones we have here at uh, Bayview Village Park. Unless you're the guy who brings the biggest telescope, you can always uh, borrow a bigger one and have a look at it, which uh, makes it worth the effort to go out. My favorite summer deep sky object is uh, the Triffid Nebula. It's one I always go to whenever I'm out observing. Um, that, it's a good one because you can you know, check off most of your list at once. It's an emission nebula, a reflection nebula, dark nebula, and a star cluster all rolled into one object. If you're uh, having a look at it and you've got a nebula filter, you can try with and without and see which part of the uh, the object appears and disappears to tell you which is which is glowing and which has just got light bouncing off it. The dark nebula is uh, Barnard 85, the uh, kind of uh, propeller-shaped thing in the middle there. And uh, if you're interested in uh, crossing things off in your observer's handbook, that's on the list of uh, dark nebula included in the deep sky section. So comets and meteors, obviously the big one is the Perseids uh, peaking on the morning of August 13th. And this year it is perfectly set for the new moon. So we're going to see, you know, we're going to see all of them, everything down to anything the human eye can see we'll be seeing, which probably means we'll be seeing clouds, but uh, you know, that's, that's what our hobby is all about. It's an excellent question. Sunday night, Monday morning? Okay. We can all take Monday off work, call in sick, right? I will. We also have the, uh, the South Delta Aquarids around July 29th, but uh, it's a much uh, less interesting uh, shower. It's around the full moon. I would say it's probably a good target to try uh, picking up uh, with a radio, looking for reflections off uh, the ionosphere, but uh, I'm not sure I'm going to uh, bother heading out in the night to uh, try and see that one. I've got a couple of good comets coming up. Uh, 21P uh, Jacobini Zinner. Uh, right now it's in Cepheus. I think it's about uh, 12th magnitude, but uh, they're promising. Uh, as it gets close to the sun, it could reach uh, naked eye brightness, maybe. Uh, C2017 S3 pan stars, right now is about 10th uh, magnitude in Camelopardalis. It's predicted to have a maximum of uh, around 7.5 in late August. And as always with uh, comets, uh, no promises. If we're lucky, we'll get a big outburst and it'll be even better. If history is a guide, it'll be worse. I kind of feel that uh, when I'm telling you about comets, I should be wearing a mask or something so that it, uh, as I'm being recorded here, no one's going to hold this against me in a month's time when they fizzled out. Now, we can't uh, go a month without a uh, variable star. Um, CI Cygni is one I've been working on. Um, it's a Z Andromedae type uh, symbiotic variable. Uh, what that means is we have a red giant and a small main sequence star, which may have an accretion disk around it orbiting each other. 
It's also possible that the red giant is so big that the, uh, the small star is actually orbiting within its atmosphere at times. So every now and then, every couple years, this one goes from about 12th magnitude to 10th magnitude or even brighter. The interesting thing about it is it happens very fast, which means the uh, automated uh, uh, telescopes aren't necessarily going to catch it during the interesting outburst phase, which makes it a good target for amateur observers like you and I. So I would go to the AAVSO website, aavso.org, uh, track down this star, sign up as an observer, print out some charts, and uh, keep an eye out for it. Um, you know, this is a uh, useful science that uh, amateurs like us can do. Yeah. Usually it's around 12th to 13th magnitude um, when, it's not, uh, when it's not an outburst. You said it happens very fast. It happens fast. It can happen, go from quiescence to full outburst in under 12 hours. So that's too fast for the, uh, the programs that take a picture every day or every three days. That will depend on us. Now, I know Blake's not here, but uh, you're going to get an interesting double star anyway on his behalf. Watching. Is he watching? Okay. There you go, Blake. I didn't forget you. Um, one I picked this time is a Tau Cygni, um, a 3.8 and 6.6 .6 magnitude pair. The small one's actually pretty much like the sun. Uh, the other's uh, obviously a much bigger the giant. Um, these ones are very close, uh, less than one arc second separation. So you need a, a five inch or better telescope, you need good seeing, you need to clean your eyepieces before you set up. But uh, the interesting thing about these guys is the period, 49.6 years. That means within a month or two you'll be able to actually see motion, you see it move a few degrees around its uh, orbit. So if you're looking for real fast action in the night sky, uh, this is the double star for you. So space flight coming up. Um, Falcon launches. Okay, I gotta admit, I'm, I don't watch the launches anymore for the launches. They're, they're getting boring for me. I don't watch unless they're gonna guarantee an attempt to land the booster. I still think that's cool. So I've pointed out the uh, the scheduled Falcon launch is coming up. Um, the Parker Solar Probe is uh, due for launch. Um, it's actually going to pass through the outer atmosphere of the sun. So that's going to be uh, some cool science. So keep an eye out for that one. Um, from now to August 11th, the ISS is going to be passing over every night. Uh, heavensabove.com for actual time and uh, location. It's because it's so close, it's going to depend on where you are, so I'm not going to predict anything here. And the other big telescope, uh, space flight news is uh, the James Webb Telescope has been delayed till 2021. So hopefully they can keep the, uh, the Hubble flying for just a bit longer. And that's what we have. Have any questions? Any questions, corrections? Okay. Good. Thanks very much. Thank you. Great job, Andy. Thank you very much once again. I know it takes quite a bit of time to prepare those presentations. Uh, Okay, so we're going to do a reboot here of a computer. <laughs> so, uh, do we have a quick announcement uh, that we can make while the machine restarts? Yes, come on down, John. That's uh, you, you have enough to use the microphone. Come on down. <clears throat> we're standing by. We're set to go. So you've had lots of time to read the title, and so it's 
Oumuamua, and the implications for the origin of life on Earth. So it's just a little project that I thought was pretty interesting, and I thought of sharing it with you. And um, I'll just set up a few uh, slides here to briefly introduce Oumuamua, which you may have heard of, and should just generally ask, everybody here heard of that or familiar with it? A lot of hands go up, so okay, so maybe some hands didn't go up. So um, I'll just do a quick uh, intro to this little object and then some more about the implications for life on Earth. And so um, what is it? It's a really nice picture here, but it's just an artist's impression. And so um, this is actually a, a very interesting object. Uh, let's have a look at some details here. It was discovered last October, so it made news around December onward. And so it became uh, pretty interesting when it was discovered that it was a very fast-moving object, but um, it was d discovered that by PennStars 1. Everybody familiar with that? Anybody know what PennStars 1 stands for? No? Panoramic Telescope? Nobody wants to guess? Okay. Anyway, it's um, this uh, big gadget you see in the lower left here. And so notice Andy didn't mention it in his presentation. Don't bother looking for it. And so it's, when it's discovered, it was around magnitude 23 or so. So it's not really as an observing object. It's just really an interesting object I thought would be worthwhile to point out here. Uh, so um, it was discovered about 40 days after its perihelion. That means it had gone by the sun, and then it was discovered after that. And the designation of 1I 2017 it's a pretty unusual designation. It's really the first ever designation with a letter I. So you see, I you saw Andy demonstrate some designations of comets, 2C and so on. Uh, so the I is the first object designated to be an interstellar object. So that's why it's pretty exciting, in my opinion. It's pretty interesting. So it's the first uh, interstellar object confirmed to be interstellar. Uh, so some uh, details to um, just point out a few details to illustrate why it's interstellar. Um, its orbital details were found to have an eccentricity of 1.2. So normally, asteroids, uh, solar system objects, have an eccentricity of 1 or less. And so a perfect circle has an eccentricity of 1. And generally, uh, orbits are generally elliptical. They have a little bit less than 1 uh, eccentricity. There are some cases where they can be slightly over, uh, maybe 1.02 or something like that. It's also possible for some asteroids to get captured and modified their orbits modified by big planets. But 1.2 is the um, uh, highest uh, eccentricity ever measured for any object, and it's uh, definitely a hyperbolic trajectory. It's not just hyperbolic, it's strongly hyperbolic. Um, so I put in a picture illustration in the bottom here to illustrate that. Um, so um, um, normally, the, um, uh, normally uh, asteroids and even most comets uh, orbit generally around the uh, plane of the ecliptic. And so the ecliptic, being the plane of a solar system where most of the planets uh, orbit in a, generally in a plane. And so this object came from well outside of a plane, um, zip past the uh, our sun and Earth, and zips off at another high angle. So I have a better illustration of it. But the other interesting detail is it's a very high velocity object. And so here's um, maybe possibly a better picture. So it gives you a better perspective. You see the outer solar system. Um, and you see the inner solar system where it's by the, zipped by the sun in October, but um, you get some impression by um, the upper diagram here that it's uh, strongly hyperbolic and not part of the solar system. But the uh, speed and the orbital eccentricity uh, make no question about it. This is an interstellar object. So that's why it's special. That's why it was discovered, generated some excitement. Um, there's a few other details about it that are not so relevant or they're, they're inter interesting by themselves. And this bottom bottom diagram plots some brightnesses. And so the squares are intended to represent, in this diagram that I used, um, the brightness. So you see maximum brightness when it's um, um, uh, fully illuminated and it's found to be rotating, but actually run rotating in complex axes. So it's actually tumbling, not rotating around one particular axis. So it's not even a variable star. It's a tumbling object. And so um, you can also get uh, some uh, spectra or, or measurements of a surface that gives some indication of what the um, composition of a surface is. This is pretty darn tough. And so I read some papers that had some uh, spectral results, and uh, it shows it's uh, generally a red color, and it's um, approximately similar to some asteroids, but it's not really conclusive. And it's uh, because the object is moving very fast, and um, very fast moving, uh, it moves out of, a slow, out of the uh, field of view, or I should say out of visibility uh, beyond uh, 23rd magnitude pretty quickly. And so it's very hard for observatories around the world to get some usable spectra. So there are a few measurements in some papers, but they're not really highly conclusive, so I didn't want to dwell on them. 
So those are just a few details that don't matter an awful lot, but they um, um, cause it to be classified uh, because it's mostly um, metal rich, classified as an asteroid, although at first it was thought to be a comet. And then uh, some specter came in and people didn't see any comet-like uh, activity, that is to say a tail or a comet around the head, so it got quickly classified as an asteroid. So that's fine, that's the way it was uh, during the winter, first few um, uh, months of the year. Um, I told um, Paul, uh, I suggested this idea to Paul, you know, he occasionally sends an email asking if anybody has um, suggestions for a presentation here. So this was last winter and I said this would be a very interesting object to present and so he said fine, we'll put it together and we'll We'll present it when we get a chance, so I thought I will simply update it whenever news comes in because there were uh, a few papers appearing from month to month earlier this year. So some news came in in March um, pointing out that it uh, probably came from a binary star system, but not just any old binary star, but a certain binary system is one that uh, has two stars orbiting fairly closely together and within each other's gravity. So there are some double stars that are binary stars and pretty far apart from each other and have long orbital periods and don't really have a huge uh, gravitational impact on planets in their vicinity, but close circumbinary systems do have a big impact. And so the, um, it was considered by some modeling and other observations that this object very likely came from the planetary formation stage of a circumbinary system. So that may um, narrow it down to, to some, uh, some uh, stars in the stellar neighborhood of, of the um, our part of the galaxy, or it may not. Uh, just another point of interest, in my opinion. But that was one bit of news that came along in March. Uh, some more news appeared in June. And that was, um, I thought this was really exciting, for, at least for the implication for life. And that was, it was decided that it was a comet, not an asteroid. And that's because it was, as, as it was tracked um, on its way out of the solar system, at very high speed, and I, I think I mentioned it was dropping below 23rd magnitude pretty quickly, it was found to be accelerating. So even after considering all the gravitational influence of Jupiter, all the planets around, all the minor planets, whatever impact they had on, their, on the orbit uh, and the velocity of this object, it was found to be accelerating slightly. So it was decided it was due to volatility, um, outgassing of some volatiles from the surface, very similar to what a comet does. And so comets outgas some volatile compounds, so it was reclassified as a comet. And so a uh, nice illustration here, but you may get the impression um, a rock heated by the sun and maybe some jets of gas or volatiles puffing off the surface and causing some acceleration in some complex form, considering that it's tumbling um, irregularly. So that was very interesting news, I thought. Uh, so those are the two uh, main news points that um, came along and um, that's I've basically I've told you all of uh, what's relevant about um, this object. And so there's some other details, but um, the main point being that it's, it's interstellar definitely from outside the solar system, and it has some volatile material on it. That's what I thought was very interesting. So that's what I'm going to tell you about Oumuamua. So uh, I also wanted to tell you about some aspects of life forming on Earth, because um, it's closely related to this object, or it could be, or you may decide for yourself. And so I should um, stop playing with this, and I should press the correct button and advance to the next slide. And so. Um, I don't know, I wasn't sure how much uh, stuff to mention about this. Anybody familiar with abiogenesis? Not too many hands, Andy is. Anybody familiar with the idea of panspermia? A few more hands, okay, good. So um, in that case, I'll, I'll spend a few minutes talking about some ideas about um, abiogenesis. Um, and so this is the idea that um, uh, life could have developed from non-living matter on the Earth. And it requires some stuff to be in place. Uh, specific chemicals need to be in place, need a good source of energy, and we have to have the formation of self-replicating molecules, which is basically basically a definition of life in the simplest uh, definition. So um, those are some requirements. Um, we need to have some chemistry present, and on Earth we have carbon and water, and so all uh, Earth-based uh, life is carbon-based. So there is lots of carbon, fortunately, and there is water, and there was uh, lots of water present in Earth's early atmosphere and in oceans. Uh, so besides that, uh, we specifically need certain chemicals, um, amino acids, which are proteins, carbohydrates, some sort of fuel source that um, a cell can, can use, um, need to have lipids, which are um, fairly complex forms of organic uh, chemicals that form a fatty tissue membrane to surround the cell and, and encapsulate a cell and allow it to survive by itself. 
And there's also something called RNA or nucleic acid. So you may or may not be familiar with all of this. I didn't want to get in too deeply into chemistry or biochemistry or geochemistry, but it is quite relevant. So I'll mention a few more details. Um, I think besides chemistry, uh, I need to have an energy source to start all this. And so um, nice illustration here, a uh, nice colorful illustration uh, illustrates a lot of these features. Uh, there, are, there are some sources of energy that could do the job. Um, ultraviolet radiation from sunlight, ionizing radiation, geothermal radiation. You may get the impression it may be representing a volcano here, but um, and there may be some, you could imagine some lightning coming from um, um, cumulonimbus sort of uh, clouds that could build up. Um, volcanoes, lightning, impact events. So you could sort of get the impression in the uh, early Earth, um, a lot of um, uh, uh, objects uh, slamming into the atmosphere or even the surface, causing impact events. and possibly transporting some of those uh, important chemicals that I mentioned. So those are energy sources that we need and have, and we're present. Um, so uh, some other conditions that were present on the early Earth, we did have water oceans, um, did have the correct sort of atmosphere in place, um, and some, some chemicals were known to exist uh, pretty early. Methane and ammonia are just fairly simple compounds of um, carbon, carbon with hydrogen, and nitrogen with hydrogen, and some other things, hydrogen and sulfur compounds. Um, metals and minerals may be pretty helpful for being catalysts that will help the process get started. Um, hydrogens and cyanide came from comets, we know that's on comets, so it was a good source of um, the chemistry and the energy available on the early Earth that could have uh, helped uh, life start by itself, the abiogenesis process. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of the um, Uri Muller experiment. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how famous it is, but maybe, maybe not. So maybe a few people may have heard of it, may not have. This is an interesting experiment for the, um, um, to help out with the idea of life forming by itself on Earth. And this was simply a case where um, Mr. M Miller put some fairly simple uh, uh, co chemical compounds together and mixed them together into a flask and put in an electrical discharge to represent lightning, the effect of lightning. I left it for a week in the lab to see what would happen. And after a week or so, it was found that um, it had formed amino acids, sugars, and lipids, just the conditions needed to form life. So that was a very interesting experiment half a century ago. Um, there are some other uh, uh, places on Earth where life could have begun. I don't know if anybody's familiar with hydrothermal vents. Um, maybe, okay, good, some people are. So uh, in case you're not, these are very interesting uh, places in the bottom of the oceans where Extremely hot water is percolating out through the crust, um, pulling some uh, minerals from the crust with it and percolating into the ocean. And um, uh, so uh, with, with these vents, it's a little ecosystem all by itself. So um, sulfur, hydrogen, um, all sorts of chemicals are in place with a, a lot of heat and a lot of interesting chemistry going on at the base of the ocean where these, hydro where these hydro hydrothermal vents are blasting out of the crust. And also, Near these uh, vents, there are some interesting life forms. So there are some uh, weird, strange, unique life forms that exist around these hydrothermal vents. So it's just one illustration of one possible location on Earth where um, life could have begun at the base of the oceans. There are others as well. Um, but I'm just going to uh, summarize it here just by saying there's a lot of evidence to support the idea that life could have begun um, by itself uh, in the abiogenesis process on Earth. So the other idea of panspermia uh, involves the seeds of life being everywhere in the universe, or at least uh, scattered anywhere, if not necessarily everywhere. So the point here is that building blocks of life, those um, uh, chemicals I pointed out, amino acids, lipids, and so on, could have been brought to Earth from space. So I showed you an uh, illustration showing um, 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 meteors or some sort of objects blasting into Earth, and you could just sort of picture some uh, potential chemicals blasting into the earth, um, a local source of energy wherever it blasts into the ocean or the surface, and some spots here or there where life could have begun. Um, is there any evidence? Sure, there is. There's lots of evidence. Some meteorites have been found to contain these amino acids. Uh, there's a lot of water and volatile organic compounds found on comets. And a lot of other bodies in the solar system are known by now to have water and organic compounds. Uh, and so I think this is a big, excite, exciting development in the past decade or so where uh, previously it was speculated that water might exist 
on Mars or other locations, and now it's known to have uh, be in oceans uh, in uh, under the crust of uh, Europa and Enceladus and uh, other spots. And I put in a picture. You notice Andy mentioned Cirrus, so here's a picture of Cirrus. And uh, it, what was interesting a few years ago, speculated to possibly be uh, ice or water. It's now known that it is water. Um, it's from the Adon space, spacecraft that um, noticed this white spot that was a mystery a few years ago. Anybody remember that? Anybody remember what a mystery it was a few years ago? So it's very interesting um, uh, development in the past few years that now it's widely known that water is all over the place, including other stars. So there's lots of evidence for the building blocks of life being in space and could have been transported to the Earth. And that's basically the, the basis of the panspermia process. Um, there's another process that was uh, fairly relevant, and you may have heard of late heavy bombardment, which is generally considered to be the period uh, in geological history when um, the moon got most of its craters. Um, uh, a lot of objects impacted the Earth as well, but because of plate tectonics, there are a lot of uh, meteor um, impact um, uh, craters are covered up and smoothed over, whereas on the moon, the evidence is right there. So the point of it being about four billion years ago when this period ended um, is that life could have begun, and, and um, if I didn't mention, uh, life began on Earth, it's known to have begun approximately in the range of 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago. So the oldest fossils are known to be about that age, so it coincides very approximately with the end of a late heavy bombardment. So this is when a large number of asteroids collided with on the planets, I mentioned the moon, uh, you know other planets uh, including uh, Mars and Mercury have uh, craters. Um, so the main point here is it's the possible source of Earth's water with, that have a similar deuterium to hydrogen ratios. So comets don't have water that has the uh, appropriate ratio of deuterium to hydrogen that Earth has, whereas uh, a lot of asteroids do. So um, it's, it's one possible source of Earth's water. So um, we have a lot of uh, 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 aspects in place to support the panspermia process. Um, we know that Earth space is a pretty hostile environment. Things travel th through space, there's irradiation, there's pretty darn cold temperatures, there's pretty hot temperatures facing the sun, so pretty hostile environment. However, uh, we do know that the um, uh, comets can have a, a, a crust over them and have water beneath them and volatile compounds that survive this hostile environment. So there's lots of evidence for panspermia. So back to um, Oumuamua, um, these, uh, uh, any asteroids or comets are, are a potential source of the organic compounds that could have been the building blocks for life on Earth. Now we have interstellar objects as well. So to me, it's exciting because it vastly improves and increases the range of potential possibilities for source regions for life. So uh, whether you see life as beginning as um, uh, the building blocks of life, these compounds I pointed out that uh, had to uh, come together on Earth, or if you say that life began somewhere as cells and got transported to Earth that way, um, now that we have interstellar objects known to be uh, whizzing by the Earth and the solar system, uh, to me it just means that the um, range of possibilities is vastly in increased. It's already known or well considered that thousands of uh, interstellar objects may already exist in our solar system that originated elsewhere and are captured by the gravity of the solar system. And that's fine. That's been uh, speculated for years. Um, un until now, there were no facts to support it. Now we do have one observation. So um, that's um, th basically all I s set out to tell you about. So before I get to the, my final slide, I did want to mention one other aspect of these very high-speed interstellar rocks, uh, their impact on Earth. And anybody want to guess what that is? If you don't, I'll just uh, get on to the next slide. So it's not a, it's not a positive effect, I'll have to admit. But um, if anybody remembers this uh, object in, me, in Russia about five years ago, um, this was a lot of energy that came in and um, fortunately disintegrated in, in the atmosphere and fortunately only uh, shock waves um, came down and broke windows and caused some uh, damage, quite a lot of damage actually and injuries. And so um, the point about um, space rocks coming into the Earth is, is that now that we know that there are uh, potentially um, big rocks, um, big rocks, uh, potentially very high speed, um, that's, it's not a good, uh, uh, not a good uh, idea for continuing life on Earth. So it's, um, it's a potential negative impact for uh, life on Earth. However, um, that's one thing I thought I ought to mention with, with the possibility of uh, high speed 
interstellar rocks coming in. So um, the final slide is just um, uh, looking at the future. And so um, we saw with this telescope called PanSTARRS-1, it's actually one of the pair that's being developed. Um, it dis it's discovering quite a lot of objects, and as I mentioned, it was around 23rd magnitude or so, and um, it means the potential for discovery of many more objects, whether they be comets, asteroids, combination of the two, or pot possibly objects we haven't heard of yet. Um, smaller and smaller uh, objects may be discovered. That's the idea with the uh, uh, idea of the uh, near-Earth object uh, observing campaigns that are underway uh, to try to ca catalog and classify these objects. Um, there are some big telescopes coming online in the next few years. Um, Giant Magellan Telescope, European Large Telescope, possibly the 30-meter telescope. Don't want to talk too much about the politics of that one, but the main point is um, new objects will be discovered. And as I mentioned, the excitement, it seems to me, is the potential increasing range of source objects for potential uh, life and the building blocks that could have started life on Earth. So that's all I set up to tell you, and so I'll stop here and... Any questions, I'll try to deflect them as well as I can. And um, Any questions? Have they traced back the source of our interstellar visitor as to where it came from? <coughs> so the source of the interstellar visitor, uh, short answer is no. The longer answer is some modeling has been done and presented in some papers saying that it probably came from um, one of the stars in the um, vicinity of the solar system. However, other papers are saying it could have been uh, in, in, uh, flying through uh, interstellar space for millions of years. It could have come from anywhere. So a first speculation was that it came from the direction of Vega, which is the direction that the solar system is moving in the sky. However, um, I, I favor the... Uh, speculation more that it could have been in space for millions of years and not necessarily came from our stellar neighborhood. So that's the best, uh, best answer there is for that. Anything else? <clears throat> I would say we're finished, Paul. No more questions? Okay. Well. Interstellar object. Fine. Uh, what was the source of the origin of that, you know, uh, uh, material? So the source of the origin, uh, so it's uh, interesting because the question of whether it's a rock or a comet is sure. interesting because the speculation is that it came from, um, uh, most likely got ejected from a circumbinary <coughs> pair of stars. And so the point about uh, star formation is that um, the planetary formation stage of a, star, of a star and a solar system um, Rocks and debris left over from the accretion process where the star forms form a disk around the star. Accretion disk that gradually separates from the planets. Um, there are some planets and there are a lot of gravitational um, interactions where smaller objects get flung out, gravitationally flung out of the system far away. And so uh, it's uh, considered that um, rocks that are closer in than the so-called uh, melting line or what's sometimes called a snow line or an ice line, certain distance from the star, uh, where um, things to separate into either rock or, or um, uh, water, ice uh, objects. Um, things close to are or rock, and they can get flung out and they become asteroids, or what we see as generally rocky or stony asteroids. Um, the farther out objects are mostly water, water and dust, and they get flung out as comets. So it's generally considered by some people who have studied it and done, done some modeling that the, um, this object, uh, the, the objects that we will f we'll find as interstellar objects will be mostly comets rather than asteroids. That's because they're farther away from their parent star, they're easier to get flung out by gravity, but in this case it was considered to be most likely flung out by a circumbinary pair of stars that had more gravitational influence that had made it easier, made it easier for the object to get flung out. So that's the best uh, speculation of where it came from. Hyperbolic orbit, yep. Okay, so the question is about the um, hyperbolic orbit. So will it come back? And if so, what is its period? Uh, so it's, it's hyperbolic orbit means it's not coming back. It's on a, a one-way path through the solar system. So the eccentricity of greater than one 
means that it's, uh, it's an open orbit, or it's not bound gravitationally. It just got, uh, came in the direction of the sun, got it, um, uh, uh, gravitationally attracted by the sun to have its orbit bent, but it's not a closed orbit. So it's not coming back, and so there's no uh, answer to the period. There is no period. How fast it's traveling, and how does that relate to other objects that similar <coughs> comets or asteroids that may be in motion? So it's a good question about the speed. So I didn't. Um, uh, I wanted to keep numbers out of this as much as possible. So I don't remember. There's, there is some number for the speed. It was found to be some number of kilometers per second, but some high number, but. I didn't put it in here, and it's not too relevant because the main point is how it compares to other objects. It's much faster than any other uh, object ever seen, much faster than any uh, asteroid bound in an orbit around the sun. So that's one reason why it's considered to be um, really special, uh, really, um, um, really interstellar, and one one reason why it occurred to me to be potentially very destructive to the Earth if a very high-speed rock hits the Earth and we can't see it coming. So. I don't have the answer in kilometers per second. There is a number published for it. Um, I just didn't bother to um, put it down here or memorize it. So that's the answer to that one. So uh, it's my first time here. I'm just a neophyte with all this, so I apologize if this is too simplistic a question. But did I understand right that four billion years ago the planet Earth existed, and but it was there was some huge influx <laughs> of flying debris? that hit it, is that what you were saying, and may have hit Mars? And exactly that. So the, the question always is, I'm not sure, um, of course, we welcome new members here all the time, or anybody that wants to walk in, so I'm never sure how much detail to put in. Uh, but the uh, quick rundown of the formation of a solar system is that it's considered to be approximately 5 billion years old, or 4 and a half, and this is a non-religious uh, non uh, response, but approximately 4 and a half to 5 billion years old is when the solar system formed out of the... Um, uh, accretion disk or, or disk of um, uh, material from which the sun uh, coalesced and condensed into the sun. There's a big disk of debris remaining around it. Foreign planets or the thicker, um, uh, the heavier, uh, more dense objects um, attracted more debris and foreign planets, the planets that we have now. Um, there's a lot of uh, smaller junk left flying around, asteroids, comets, wherever they were. Um, so it's considered, that because of gravitational influences from the other planets, um, it's considered that about four billion years ago, after the solar system had formed, but four billion years ago from now, as a general time range, it's considered to be, um, yes, there's a huge bomb period of more, uh, more asteroids than, than before or after, bombarding the Earth and all of the inner solar system. Um, it's, so that's been found by uh, uh, lunar crater ages, uh, craters found on Mars and on Mercury, where there's no plate tectonics to erase the craters that are evidence of that. So um, if you're asking about, uh, did I understand it correctly? Yes, that's, it was called heavy bombardment because it was a relative, relatively bombarding period in the um, formation of the Earth. Um, my point was that when, when that finished, um, it coincides approximately with the time when life began, according to our oldest fossil. So does that sort of answer the question? Okay. I guess we ran out of questions, Paul. Well, um, there was one question for me, Ian. Uh, is, sorry, just, just about the shape of our visitor. Is any thoughts or ideas on why it would end up being in that quite that shape? So the shape of it, um, you see it had an aspect ratio of approximately 10 to 1, or approximately 10 times longer than it is wide. So it's considered to be a collision, uh, a, colli a rock that uh, formed in collision um, in its early its solar system, wherever that was, uh, formed by um, collisions. And that's how it formed chunks. So that's the formation of asteroids in general. Um, just a bunch of rocks colliding, and it was considered to be just simply a collision. So I don't think there's any more information about it than that. There's been a few papers about um, uh, that implies that its origin was from a collision, but it just confirms that it was uh, an early solar system somewhere where there were a lot of collisions in the uh, pro process of um, accretion and collision in its uh, formation. So, okay. Okay, Paul, I think we're done. Thank you very much, Frank.
Okay, thank you for sharing, uh, Frank. Very interesting. And our next speaker is just about ready to join us. We have uh, Ron McNaughton talking to us about the dance of the red planet. And it's going to up here. We'll get started shortly. I, I asked uh, Andrew to leave these two comments out of the version that gets finally through, but I, I want to thank Frank for helping me with some of the research for the Mars talk. I appreciate what he did, and I forgot that you were giving a talk, and on top of all getting all that ready, you were helping me, so I'm grateful. And uh, I also didn't make the picnic in the CAO, but I was able to see the Sarah Seeger talk, and it was so wonderful to... Uh, experience that, and I just want to express an appreciation in general for Andrew, Betty, and Ward for all the work they do to set up the um, projection system. Now, um, I'm not sure what I pressed to go, just, this is, Okay, good, thank you. Um, I love the poetry of the phrase dance of the planets. And I can see ancients looking at the sky and they see these bright objects move back and forth. And sometimes I go higher in the sky, lower. And, and it was a real mystery and it wasn't really until Kepler figured out what, uh, what causes orbits and paths that there was an understanding. But there's a real poetry behind it. And I want to talk a little bit about my first experience with astronomy, other than as a kid, where I enjoyed uh, a little telescope. But uh, about 25 years ago, Rosemary Kelsch told me there was a telescope store in Schomburg. So I went to the plaza and went upstairs and went into this magical place by John and Suzanne Kidner, Perceptor. I don't know, has anybody here ever been to Perceptor store? Just a wonderful place, and they had... Um, eyepieces and books and charts and telescopes and more telescopes and more telescopes. What they didn't have is an awful lot of space to walk. It was really crowded. And when I got there, I uh, waited for them to help other people. And then eventually Suzanne talked to me and she asked me a question that I couldn't answer. What do you want to do with a telescope? And I know I wanted to get a better view of the universe, but I really didn't know what I wanted. So she said, why don't you go to the erroneous star party that's two weekends from now? So I got my tent all organized and I drove up to uh, near Camp Borden and the first night was, just blew me away. Different people showing me different objects through their telescopes. Everybody's willing, you know, you walk up, do you want a view? Yes, that's just the ethos of, of, of star parties. And then, um, I learned new words. I had no idea what polar alignment was. Bad seeing. Um, a pixel. I didn't even know what a pixel was 25 years ago, and people were talking about that. And then there were talks the next day, and Terence Dickinson talked about Mars. And he said that. And that blew me away. And I'd been chained to astronomy for 25 years. He was wrong, though. He should have included. <laughs> and that's part of my story, and that's where Frank really, really helped me. Um, to talk about dancing, you don't just dance with your partner, but you dance compared to the room. So I sort of have to start. Is there a, 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 a can I get a pointer with this? Oh, OK. All right. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, the Earth goes around the sun uh, counterclockwise from above. All planets do. And let's say we're at the, well, the northern spring equinox. And in there, what we can do, what happened to the mouse? There we are. At the northern spring equinox, which is um, in March, we can see in the evening the stars of Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, etc., and all the messiers there. 
uh, if we want to, at uh, midnight, we can look opposite the sun and we can see Virgo and his wonderful collection of galaxies that we can also see. And if we stay up all night, we can see constellations from uh, Capricorn all the way through, and we can pretty well get uh, all the messiers. Now, I got 102. Did anybody get 110 all messiers? Has anybody done in the same night? Yeah, I, I got them all, but not in the same night. Um, anyway, um, at the same time then, we're looking through the sun, and the sun is in front of the stars of Pisces, and uh, that's not that big a loss because there's not much interesting there. No, I shouldn't say that. Now, similarly, in the summer solstice here, when the sun is in front of my uh, uh, zodiac constellation, Gemini, and because the summer sun is high in the sky, Gemini is a constellation that's way north of the celestial equator. And conversely, in our winter, where the sun is in front of Sagittarius, and it's low in the sky, uh, and it's below the equator. Now, let's get here. The ancients measured the length of the seasons, and they could work out the uh, solstices by the... Um, uh, position of sunrise, sunset, etc., and the equinoxes. And it turns out the spring and summer equinoxes are, or seasons are about 93 days long. The fall is 90, and the winter is 89. Not quite sure why, but it turns out that the path of the Earth around the sun is an ellipse, and when it's closer, perihelion, it's faster. So we get through winter faster than we do summer, although from the complaints I got this year, I'm not sure that's always true. Um, the seasons, of course, are caused by the tilt of the Earth uh, compared to the Sun. And there's an interesting movie where Harvard graduates explain seasons, and these guys that graduated from Harvard said, you know, somebody comes up and says, why do we have seasons? And they, uh, I think it's because we're closer to the Sun in the summertime. Wrong. We're actually further away from the Sun in our summertime. Um, and I have a question for all of you later, by the way, to see your, your knowledge. Now, the orbit of Mars is much less round than our orbit. And it's, um, uh, these diagrams are to scale, by the way. And their seasons are about a season uh, ahead of ours. So if there's an opposition at our summer solstice, and Mars is opposite Earth, it's going to be fall equinox or one season ahead. So. That's a general pattern for the Mars uh, seasons. And when you look at the Mars seasons, remember there was four days difference between the longest and shortest season on Earth? Well, it turns out spring is over 50 days longer than fall in Mars. This is northern spring. And the northern summer is 25 days longer, roughly, than the uh, northern winter. And that's because this orbit is so far from being round. And, of course, in a week and two days, we have our opposition. And the definition of opposition is when the planet is opposite in the sky to the sun. But I prefer to think of it as when we're cutting the corner on the inside and we pass between them. To me, an equivalent definition. Now, let's start looking at the constellations. This is against the stars of Capricorn. And Capricorn, like Sagittarius, is relatively low in the sky because that's a, a winter um, a, a constellation that is, um, uh, the sun is in in the wintertime. So before we even start, it turns out that Mars is going to be low in the sky. But it's worse than that. Mars is also slightly tilted compared to the Earth. And this is actually to scale and with the right angle, and the sloping line is a line of notes. And actually, if a Martian were there, and it was an opposition at that moment, uh, Mars would see a transit of Earth. Okay, because it would be in a straight line. Otherwise, Mars is either above or below. But in our opposition, it's now below the plane now, the angle is only a little under two degrees, but it's magnified because this distance here is, uh, it might be two degrees or less than two degrees from there, but from here, it actually ends up being six degrees below the ecliptic. 
So using my Starry Night program, Mars on the night of the opposition is 20 and a half degrees above the horizon. That's the best view we're going to get of it. And um, see how far below it is the ecliptic. And at the same time, we've got a full moon almost right next to it. So it's a great opposition and close, and I'm going to get to that in a bit. But uh, we have several things going against us. So when to see Mars? Uh, Friday, July 27th is the actual opposition when we pass on the inside. And I'm rounding to 24 arc seconds. And it's going to be 1126 before it gets 15 degrees up in the sky. I just picked a number. There's nothing magical about that. But see how here Mars is still getting closer to the sun because this is a perihelion? So the closest approach is actually a little after the opposition day. And we actually get closest approach next Tuesday. And it's uh, a little bit higher, and it's, uh, I write, 100%. And the following week, a week after opposition, we get basically the same view as opposition night. So we can keep showing Mars. It doesn't have to just be opposition night. But there's more to it yet. And this might be a little complicated, but uh, I'll, I'll give it to you. Um, I had my students calculating the... Um, the speed of the planets from a table of uh, average uh, radii of orbit and the number of uh, years for a, a period. And they had to work out the kilometers and seconds and divide it. And I had the class, um, if you're born in January, February, you do Pluto, which is a planet, then March, April, etc. And then I said, and everybody named Venus do Venus, and that girl just beamed. Anyway. It turns out we go 30 kilometers a second, Mars is 24, the difference is six. That's almost four million kilometers a week and 15 million a month. And that is one-tenth of the um, astronomical unit or distance between the Earth and there. So what I did is this is scaled to be one, uh, 15 million kilometers. Again, this is to scale, but the, the models of the planets aren't. Um, and it turns out that over a month, both planets move forward and Earth moves that much further forward. So it only gets a little bit further away over a whole month. So one week after opposition, it's the same size. Two weeks, it's 97% of the size. 394, four weeks after opposition, all of August, it's up to 90% of its size. And it's going to be um, September, it's going to be visible. And hopefully the dust storm will be gone by then. But um, uh, we actually get to keep the, a, good size, a good view of Mars for a long time. And this actually is a bigger version of Mars than the opposition Terence Dickinson was talking about when he made that comment that really, really uh, grabbed me. Now the next opposition. Um, Mars orbit is 1.88 years. So when it goes all the way around once, Earth goes around once, and then 88% of an orbit, so it might end up, I'm not sure exactly, there. Then Mars keeps going. And it takes until October 13th, 2020 for the next opposition. Now, there's something a little perverse about the way Mars works, because this opposition is two years and 77 days. And it's exceptionally long, because in this period, Mars is close to the sun, it's really booting it. And it's an extra long time. The average is two years and 49 days. And actually, we end to get more oppositions here when Mars is slower than we do here. So the best season for Mars oppositions, we, A, it's the low in the sky in our hemisphere, and B, they happen relatively rarely. So that's uh, kind of perverse, but that's, we accept nature as we get it. Now, I've made uh, three diagrams here for the oppositions. This is the one in O3, and you see the orbit is just a little smaller than the line. All these lines are the same length, by the way. This is the length for our opposition coming up in a week. And that one is a little further away, but they're still pretty good oppositions. So combining those, you see that 
the one coming up in two years' time is 92% as good, and the one in 2003 was only a little bit better than ours. Now, dancing is more than just moving around the room. You also have uh, more subtle features, so I'm now going to talk about what happens to the polar caps. And this is a quiz, and if you don't know the answer, I'm asking people to guess. In the southern hemisphere, well, first of all, let me say, um, the ice, the water ice part of the polar cap stays put, but the carbon dioxide part uh, sublimates in the summertime and then reforms in the wintertime, so it goes, it goes back and forth. Now, in the southern hemisphere, it has a short summer, this is the southern summer, because it's moving fast, and it has a long, slow winter near Apelion when it's further away and colder. In the northern hemisphere, you have a short winter near there and a long summer up here. So which do you think would have a bigger ice cap? I, I ask people, don't be afraid to be wrong. Who thinks, without knowing, who thinks the northern hemisphere would have the bigger Ice cap. Can, can I just see, anybody want to make guesses or do you not want to make guesses? So, some people say the north. Who thinks the southern hemisphere would have the bigger ice cap? Okay, it's too dark for me to count. I'm flabbergasted at the answer. And I made these two pictures to scale. So, why? It could be that the lower elevation in the northern hemisphere, um, it may be attracted more uh, water vapor from the planet that's not there. Um, it could be the mountains here that's higher, there's less vapor in the air. Not only that, it turns out that these caps aren't even centered on the North Pole, and the South Polar region, the permanently water frozen part, isn't even at the actual pole. That's the actual pole, and the cap goes there. And if you look at the North Polar cap, you see these spiral patterns, and this is the North cap, and it doesn't make sense to me, but I read that these are places where the wind is bent by the Coriolis effect, the spinning of the planet, and they whoosh down through valleys, and they scour them out. But that's, uh, that's uh, part of the planet. But I'm not quite sure why it's that direction. To me, it would be the other, but uh, um, there are lots of things I don't understand. There's another part that I didn't know about before I researched here, and that is the, in the winters or the summers, you get uh, a lot of carbon dioxide getting taken into the ice caps, but in the spring or the fall, they're relatively small. One is growing, one is shrinking. And when you look at it, there's actually less atmosphere pressure in the height of winter and the height of the other winter. And you have a higher atmospheric pressure uh, during the, uh, the seasons because the uh, carbon dioxide has not yet been frozen into the other or sublimated into the other uh, thing. And uh, Curiosity, the rover, had a barometer, and this shows the data. And there are a few interesting things about the data. Um, it definitely, the pressure gets greater towards the southern spring. And um, the other thing is you see little bumps back and forth, and I don't know if they're like low pressure areas going through or something or the Martian weather. And I'm astounded at the difference in pressure between day and night and how that affects winds, and are there strong winds near the terminator or sunset points? Maybe that's what stirs up the dust storms. Lots of questions I don't know the answer to. Oh, dust storms. Um, I've seen a number of pictures like this, and to think you're uh, in a place and suddenly this wall of dust approaches you, it would be so scary, but I gather when it passes you, you just have dust all over you, but you can still breathe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that would be terrifying for me to experience. Um, this two pictures were taken, uh, I think it's a week apart, in 2001, and uh, just the planet suddenly got covered. Um, Damien Peach, has anybody heard of Damien Peach? 
He takes awesome planetary photos, and he got time in a, photo, in a um, telescope in Chile, I think it was two meters in diameter, I'm not sure, and he got this picture, and notice how big the south cap is. It's, it's entering southern uh, summer, but that's mostly carbon dioxide, and only a tiny bit is going to be um, um, uh, water ice. And here's the sequence. I'll go back, and I think these are two days apart, and it's getting covered. Last night I got up at um, four in the morning, set up my telescope, Mars was already too low, and I couldn't see any features on it, and the seeing was not particularly good, and I couldn't see uh, details, but I tried for, for this. Okay, when did dust storms start? It turns out that I got different dates, and most dust storms start in the southern, um, uh, from the fall equinox or the southern spring equinox, but not all. Um, the other thing is that with one exception, there are never two dust storms in consecutive oppositions, which is good news for 2020, because this June uh, 2001 dust storm was totally global, but um, two years later, in the big one in 2003, it was pristine and great. So uh, we can hope well for the next one. Um, another factor in the dust storms is when the big cap started sublimating and the carbon dioxide comes out, and that makes winds themselves that could be a factor. Now, the Americans have sent two missions to, or well, more than two, but these are two main ones to orbit, and I've given the years. And they're continually taking pictures, looking down at Mars and doing all sorts of measurements. And um, it turns out Mars Global Surveyor uh, uses a laser that bounces back and they measure the return time and they're able to get very detailed levels. And if you find the right map, you can actually zoom in to like a few kilometers across. The detail you can get out of this is amazing. And there are a few points I want to make about it. Um, the purple areas are lowest, and this must have been the Hellas Basin, must have been some collision at some time. For some reason, the northern hemisphere is relatively flat and lower, which says something about the rock structure within Mars. I'm not quite sure why. And at one time, it looks like uh, these volcanoes caused major melting and there were major floods. And these are low areas. And these three volcanoes, well, actually, maybe four. I think that was evidence at some stage there was plate tectonics on um, Mars. I'm looking at Chris to see if he's nodding or not. Um, because it reminds me of Hawaii, where you have a series of volcanoes that form uh, over, over a hotspot. Now, this graph was in the paper that Frank found for me. And what they did is over a six Martian year cycle, they took photographs and they're able to find the dust storms and they related it to the longitude of Mars and I've given the seasons northern winter, etc. It turns out the green ones here, oh, the height of this gives the area of the dust storm. Some of them start and then they very quickly fade. Some of them grow and they become uh, global dust storms. Uh, it turns out the green ones are southern, which happen in the southern winter and the black ones, with a few exceptions, the black ones are in the seasons where it would be the southern, uh, uh, northern summer. So I found that a little bit surprising. And there are many more black ones than there are uh, green ones. Now, I wasn't sure what caused dust storms, and I was asking Frank, and then I didn't bug him again because I knew he was busy with his talk. And I found some pictures of these dust walls that were taken from airplanes that are like 50 kilometers long. And originally I wondered if what's happening is a thunderstorm is sending a burst of air down and it blows out and it causes this, but thunderstorms aren't that big. So I wondered if it was a frontal storm. So hopefully I've got this right. This diagram is my effort to make a cold front. Um, and what happens is the area here is cold air that is pushing forward. 
and it rises the it causes the uh, less dense warm air to go across uh, above it and cause clouds and rain and I noticed during a front passage is you get a sudden fast wind and that gust is the sort of thing that would raise um, dust so they also took all this data to the source of the storm and what happens is the red ones are dust storms that started by some frontal activity. The black is not frontal. I'm not quite sure what would cause those. And the orange are ambiguous. And it could be that, and an orange one, remember this is over six years. It's not one year. The orange ones, maybe um, the Mars was going the opposite side of the sun for us and we just couldn't get the data. Um, so most of the storms are in... Um, frontal, and most of them are in the northern summer and northern fall, and um, this is still part of the research. Where do the storms mostly start? This is the most common source of the, oops, let me go back. What did I do wrong? This is the most common source of the storm. There are lots of dust storms that come from here. This is the main source of southern storms. But doesn't it make sense where you're lower, the pressure is higher, and a wind of a given speed is more likely to raise the dust? So um, uh, there are various patterns. By the way, the dust storm that we're experiencing right now started from here, and somehow or other a storm was able to envelop the whole planet. And my understanding is... Northern storms don't go across the equator and become a storm in the southern hemisphere. Coriolis force and all that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, it's kind of strange to me, and I think an awful lot of scientists are still figuring this out as well. Okay, I made this sketch, and this is the solid surface of Mars. And it turns out the surface, remember they have thermometers on the surface, it has cooler days and warmer nights, giving a lower average temperature, but not as much as I expected. Um, spacecraft find that during dust storms, you get a lot of water vapor carried to the upper atmosphere. And, um, of course, the top of the dust layer, the sunlight coming in, when it hits it, it's much warmer than it otherwise would be. But MAVEN has found that there are many more, much more loss of water and hydrogen from Mars during dust storms than there are in all the rest of the time. And remember, they have a dust storm maybe once every... Uh, three seasons, so these are uh, unfortunately now, but not that common. Now I'm going to end by talking about two oppositions, and I have Hubble pictures from both. Um, the lower down one is the big one in August 2003. There was no dust storm because there had been a dust storm the previous time through, and it looks like it does something to the surface of Mars to make it less likely to make a dust storm. And the other one is March 10th. Now, these two yellow lines are the same length, and see how much further away Mars is there. Um, this one is in the southern summer, and this one is in the northern summer. And that's the difference. Notice how much bigger it was then. Uh, notice the south cap, and the... 2003 one is a little earlier in the season, and I think the uh, 1997 one is later in the season, so more of the uh, carbon dioxide in the top is being sublimated away. And of course, they're pointing to different latitudes. Anyway, thank you very much, and uh, there's a picture of somebody growing potatoes, and I don't know if we're going for french fries. <laughs> thank you very much. Questions for Ron. Ed. Okay. Wait up. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, so this is a more of a comment than a question, but you have some. The other Mars and Mars and Earth is the fact that Mars rotates just a little bit more slowly than the Earth. So, as every night, if, as we go out, we're seeing the same side of the planet, but it slowly shifts over weeks and months. 
Um, yes, and my understanding is the crews that run, run ro rovers have to be awake when their rover is on the day side, so they continually have to shift their hours where they uh, go to sleep a little bit later every night and then get up a little bit uh, whatever, and it's quite difficult. It's sort of like uh, people that do shift work where they have to work nights uh, because of that. But if we look at Mars one night and can see features, which you can't right now, um, actually, it looked the same last night as it did the night before. No, I didn't say that. Um, but, uh, but you are right. Okay. Any other question? Oh, uh, can you let somebody get a mic for you? This has really got to do more with, our, with more with our environment. Now you've heard a lot of our north, uh, the icebergs breaking away. Mm -hmm. Okay, how come we never hear anything of the south, the south part? Because they do have the ice down there. My understanding is um, there's significant ice loss of Antarctica and icebergs are drifting. I heard, it seems to me a few years ago, the world's largest iceberg that was known what, you know, calved off from, from Antarctica. But I think there's no landmass right next to it that is going to be interfered with the iceberg, iceberg. So maybe we don't hear much about it, or maybe it's just, it's down there and that doesn't matter. The only thing that's important is here, you know, so, so but it's a good point. How is this going to affect like our atmosphere? We've been having a lot of change of weather. I presume this has a lot to do with that. Um, you're talking about climate change now? Yes, correct. Um, who knows how our climate is going to change in the long term, although it seems pretty clear there's a direction that it is changing. It's getting quite uh, drastic. Pardon me? Compared to other years, it's getting quite drastic. Um, I think it's pretty clear evidence. Um, I can't say I'm an expert on, on that, so I can't go too far in terms of helping you on that. Well, you know, but lot, I, I think there is a change, though. I'll tell you, a lot of this weather right now is what we had in the 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. We had very cold winters and very hot summers. Oh. Now, it seems like we're going back to it. Because I used to live, uh, when I was in grade one, in the Pape and Danforth area. Mm -hmm. Now, we made igloos. Wow. And the streetcars couldn't go because it was so frozen over. And then in the wow. summer, it was very, very hot. So that's what I remember of that time. So that's all I can I, say. I know I, I lived at uh, Avenue Road in Lawrence growing up, and my father was able to put a rink in that we could skate on for... Um, maybe three months, and it would stay in for those three months. And nowadays, even further north in Bolton, you couldn't get a rink that would stay in for three months. So, you know. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. I, 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 I'll talk to you later if you want. I've just, it's not my area of expertise in terms of global warming, so I can Yeah, no, yeah. So a quick comment about that, Ron, is that um, it's a well-known fact, or it's not well-known, it is a definite fact that uh, southern Hemisphere Antarctic ice is increasing, so it's, uh, it's fairly uh, distinctive, uh, no question about it, uh, whereas Arctic ice has been decreasing in the past few years. Relevance to Mars is that we're just coming to grips now with more and more research about big cycles that affect Earth's climate. Similar thing on Mars, um, it's been under study for the past decade or two with uh, uh, constant operational observations by spacecraft. We just, we don't even know why um, why uh, uh, there are uh, global dust storms occurring every several years instead of every year. So just by observations, we're, we're gaining more knowledge about big, uh, big scale cycles that affect the planet. Similar on Earth, similar on Mars. So uh, that's why a quick comment I wanted to make. Okay, thank you. And um, that paper that you referred me to that I showed the graphs, it, uh, it clearly shows there are patterns. Chris. Hi, Ron. Just a tip um, for folks that plan to observe Mars over the next while. Um, a moon filter or a variable polarizer or anything to dim it down, you might get some more details off the surface. And then you can bring in some color filters as well to enhance some of the surface features if the dust is not too harmful for us. I, I found a month ago the best details I could get were with a red filter. And... Um, 
density filter, your, your moon filter on it, and try to, it'll reduce the bloat on the planet and make it a little bit. Yeah, more good visible. point. It is quite bright, not just looking with naked eye, but in a telescope. It's a, it's a very bright uh, thing in the sky right now. Too bad I can't see the details I'd like to see. Oh, Joel? Just, just I think. Do the dust storms make. Uh, oh, yeah. Is it on? I think it's on. Yeah. Uh, do the dust storms make Mars look brighter to us, or does it not affect that? I've, I've seen a discussion at it about that, and it looks like some frequencies of light or wavelengths of light are brighter than they were before, but I can't remember which is which. But there was a discussion on that in the Rascals group, I think. Okay, and Thank enjoy you. your chips when we go to the bar. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ron, for a very educational topic. Lots of questions about it. Okay, our next speakers are getting ready. I, was, I thought it was going to be the whole family. It's just you guys. Oh, very good. <laughs> going solo. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, we have uh, Arashi and uh, Arushi and Ar Artash, okay, uh, Nath, uh, and uh, they'll be talking to us about modeling the deep uh, space network uh, from Earth to outer space. So who's going to get wired up? And maybe you'll hang on to this one? <laughs> okay. everyone. My name is Artash. And my name is Arushi. Um, thanks for having us here at the, um, at the, um, uh, the Science Center meeting today. We are a maker family and we've been making projects for the last five, six years. And we're really interested in space and science. And today we're going to share a bit about one of our recent projects. So, um, there are many um, satellites and orbiters and um, inside in the solar system and a bit beyond. And they take images, videos, and they get lots of data that we receive on Earth to make to con And so how do we get that data on Earth? So the main way to get data from these satellites on Earth is through the DSN the Deep Space Network. The Deep Space Network is an array of three giant um, radio dishes, basically radio antennas, spread around three places on Earth. So um, on Canberra, Australia, Madrid in Spain, and United States in Goldstone. So all of these three places are around 120 degrees away from each other so that we can communicate to any satellite anywhere at any time. So, yeah, here's just a little image showing the different areas that the DSN covers. So it's communicated to over 33 spacecrafts, and it operates well 24/7, 365, or in some cases 366. So the D the DSN is used in almost all of the missions that go beyond Earth. So not only the United States, but also the Euro European Space Agency, India, and Japan. Now, the DSN is really interesting and amazing invention because otherwise, um, without the DSN, we wouldn't be able to do all, all the communication between the missions. The farthest, the farthest probe that the DSN is communicating with right now is the Voyagers. And so since it's so interesting, we wanted to remodel a bit how it works ourselves. 
So, some, 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 a couple of weeks ago, there was a rocket making a workshop at the Carr Astronomical Observatory by Tony Harvarton. And everyone, uh, lots of people learned how to make um, ro model rockets. So, we wanted to get a bit more out of these our model rockets. And we wanted to actually get telemetry data from our rockets, just like the DSN gets data from its satellites. So we um, recently, we participated in an event with Kitsko Jeunesse. And we, they also gave us a box of micro bits, so 10 like little chips that, that, uh, that have a couple sensors and pins. And we, so we, um, they also have an accelerometer and a compass. So we, were, we thought we could like hook up an, um, a micro bit to our rocket to collect um, acceleration on x y and z axis and compass readings and so it, it like basically com there was two micro bits one of them on the rocket one of them on connected to our laptop and the one on the um, and basically they communicated through radio at a frequency of around 2.41 gigahertz so yeah. here, here's an image the micro bit in the rocket and we taped the micro bit to my, our laptop to get the data from the rocket. So we wanted to find out what was the range that the micro bits could communicate to each other. So at the column observatory, we did an experiment and found out that it could communicate the most distance when the receiver was very high. So. Yeah, we had, to, we had to do a bit of coding to get all of this working. So we used one of the microbit programs, a JavaScript editor, pretty simple. And um, we created this code that basically set a radio frequency, a 228. This, it's not really a radio, like there's different channels because microbits can transmit between um, a, cert, a, a, cert, a certain um, radio frequency and within that radio frequency, they have 256 channels that you could use. So here on the start, I'm setting the transmitting power to the maximum at 7. So we can get the largest distance. I'm setting the radio ch channel. And here I'm just getting the acceleration data combined together in CSV format. Because CSV format's um, a good way because um, it's, you, computers can read it really easily. So um, we were we were able to get um, pretty good pretty good data, um, not the full flight though because the micro bits didn't have that big range and the rockets flew pretty high. So we were able to get most of the launch of the rockets and part of the descent. So here's a graph of the Z accelerometer readings at the open house a couple weeks ago, and. So it's measuring right now in gravitational forces. And on the x-axis is the time. So that's just the raw data. Then we wanted to analyze it further, of course, to get uh, more out of the data. So we calculated the velocity, too. So we used the formula um, final velocity is equal to u, the initial, uh, the initial velocity, plus at, acceleration multiplied by time. So you can see at the beginning, the yellow line. The yellow line is the um, final velocity. And the blue line is just the acceleration upon the z-axis. Z so at the beginning, until like 6.88 seconds, you can see that the line's pretty straight. So it's basically on the launch pad before getting launched. Then on the yellow line, you can see it's jerking up. And on the blue line, you can see it's like kind of making like a little rectangle up. That's the launch time. So it goes up. Um, the acceleration gets higher, and then it, it reaches the top, basically, where um, the, it, the parachute pops out of the rocket to slow down its descent, and the acceleration is slowly decreasing as the rocket goes down. So we also attached a camera on board the rocket to, to just like get the video of the rocket, and yeah, I'm just going to play it.
See the pond and the corresponding blobs of rage root. It went pretty close to the pond, but luckily it didn't go into, into the pond. I mean, we're to get the camera back. <laughs> so, to, to improve our um, little project here, um, we wanted to get a bit more range, like if we're going to launch rockets higher with more powerful motors, you know, the little motor that goes in the back of the rocket to power it up. We want, um, like, you know how the DSN has many different, um, many different radio antennas, like on each side it has four. So we wanted to create like a mesh of radio, of uh, micro bits, so that we could point them in different directions. So at the beginning, there's one pointing just towards the launch pad, so we could get when it's launching, then one pointed all the way up, so maybe we'll get a bit more distance on the top when it goes even higher. And another thing we could do is like, maybe like if we're gonna put 200 meters, a microbit can maybe do 100 meters on a good range, like no, no big jerks in the data. So we could attach, put a drone at 100 meters. So the, the rocket would transmit to the drone. The drone would take the signal and reinforce it and send it back to the microbits on the base. Um, so just he here's um, live, um, you know, on the DSN website, they provide live data. Not actually the data, but they tell you which, um, which radio antennas are transmitting at what time and whether they're transmitting to the um, satellite or the satellite transmitting back to them. So I'm just going to show you the live data. It's not actually showing on the screen. Um, but right now in Madrid, um, there's one of one of the radio antennas, um, 54 that's transmitting, and three others. Um, sadly, I can't actually get them on the screen. So, um, so since we want to um, just um, make a little model of how the DS, uh, when the DSN communicates to different satellites using the website that you get live data from. So, yeah. So we took a, well, a kind of box, kind of, and then we attached a puzzle to it and to show where the DSN is communicating. Basically, we, um, we, we wanted to put a big space background to represent where is the DSN communicating. So we took an old solar system puzzle that we got like six, seven years ago, and we pasted it as a background for our project. So, so um, you know how we ha there's, 12, there's 12 different radio antennas? Um, well, we, we, we couldn't actually get all of the 12, but we took nine of the radio dishes and we programmed a small Wi-Fi Arduino to um, kind of like a little Wi-Fi protocol to the website to um, know when is the dish transmitting at what time. And there was nine LEDs on the board here. So. So three LEDs represent dishes from Spain, three from Australia, and three from the United States. When the dishes are communicating with the satellite, the lights start flashing. 
So uh, yeah, this is the old solar system puzzle. Uh, so uh, because of the limitations of the, the, the chip we are using, we could only get nine. So it's just connecting to the internet, and once it connects to the internet, it's able to log into the to the to the DSL network and it's able to get the some of those uh, port bits. Uh, next time you do your rocket flying, would you consider doing more than one flight to gather more data? Well, um, uh, at the car farm club observatory, we were only able to do um, one flight with the microbit because we didn't have much time to launch rockets. But just a couple days ago, we went um, to um, uh, the Cambridge Rocket Club field. So they have a field um, near Guelph where they launch rockets with up to G engines, huge rockets, um, like this high. And we launched our rocket four or five, five times, and we were able to get data, um, five different graphs of data, which we are now analyzing. And yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all, again, extremely impressive. <laughs> and my understanding, I could be wrong. It's been a while since I've read into this, but I think that the way that radio telescopes work a lot of the time is that they operate on a basis called radio interferometry. Does that sound familiar? Have you heard no. of that term? No? Do you know exactly how these satellites communicate with each other? over that long period, or that long distance? How satellites communicate between themselves, or yes. how? Um, well, satellites themselves have dishes. Yes. Um, so within the Earth's orbit, it's not that large of a distance between the no. satellites. So even when they're small dishes, they're able to still communicate to each other. In the radio yeah. frequency, and yeah. Actually. Uh, yeah, uh, this is not the radio interfer interferometry actually in this case because it's simply communicating as soon as uh, the satellite passes overhead over the 120 degree angle of the particular, uh, you know, the, the site basically, it's able to get, uh, you know, it's able to link up basically, uh, you know, upward link and a downward link. And that's when it's able to transfer the data. Oh, uh, really? So I'm not sure about, but yeah, these decisions are also used for scientific experiments, basically finding the time it takes for the data to come back, and that uh -huh. they use it for basically uh, trying to find the speed of the, of the velocity of the satellites. Right. And they use it during the Cassini-Saturn because they found out when the Cassini was 
passing through the rings and above the rings. So they were trying to see how much the, the radio waves change when they pass through the rings and without the rings. And that's why they were able to analyze what the rings were made of. Oh, so that I was see. Uh, the, the whole idea. Okay. Well, that's a very useful application to find how fast the satellites are traveling because if you're using you're detecting when the satellites pass over a certain point, the only leg you're dealing with is the time for the signal from the satellite to reach your detector. And considering the speed of light, that's extremely fast, right? Correct. Wow, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Concludes our speakers for tonight, and uh, here is uh, our president, Raul Chu, who will take care of the announcements for this evening. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's been a great evening. Uh, Four very good talks. Thank you very much indeed for, uh, for that uh, really good program tonight. Uh, before I actually start on the announcements, I have a card up here that I'd like you to uh, consider signing before you go tonight. It's for Peter Hiscox, who is uh, this year's uh, Austrian de Ramsey Award uh, recipient, as well as a, a former uh, first vice president and also uh, recently the uh, chair of our Light Pollution Abatement Committee. Uh, I was trying to arrange to present his award to Peter because he was unable to be up at the uh, uh, open house and uh, awards picnic last weekend. And uh, yesterday I got a message from him explaining why he was not there. He is very gravely ill. Um, the outlook is not good. And um, so I'm going to arrange to uh, meet with him and present him the award uh, privately. But in the meantime, I thought it'd be nice to just send him a little card of uh, just expressing our good wishes to him. So uh, please uh, feel free to sign the card if you wish uh, at, at the end of the meeting. Okay, so we're going to uh, just look a little bit at some of the things that are coming up over the next uh, few, few weeks before our next meeting. Uh, the next meeting, of course, uh, another Recreational Astronomy Night meeting on uh, Wednesday, August the 15th. And uh, do we know who's going to do the uh, yes, yes, we do. Uh, Sky Ah, uh, semi-permanent gig. Okay, great. Uh, uh, we'll have Blake coming in uh, to talk about measuring double stars. And then Mehdi Bozo Ray will be uh, discussing exploring the Kuiper Belt with the New Horizons spacecraft. Okay, uh, solar observing. Next uh, session out on the telescope here at the Science Center will be on the 28th of July. Uh, and then, uh, because of the holiday weekend following, the backup date will be two weeks after that in case the sky is not clear on the uh, 28th. And uh, in the usual way, we have uh, go or no-go calls that get posted to the forum as well as uh, on our Facebook and Twitter and so on uh, along the way as well to advise the public as well as members about that. So again, if you're uh, interested in solar observing, Sean is the person who uh, coordinates all of that and he'll be the one who does the go no-go. Okay, dark sky uh, star party will be first clear night on the week of the 6th to the 9th of August at Long Sioux Conservation Area, uh, set up uh, at dusk. And uh, the star party for uh, the city, uh, Bayview Village Park, will be the following uh, week, the first clear night, uh, except for the Wednesday, which is our meeting night. And again, the go, no go will be done uh, online in the various uh, uh, media and forum uh, by the coordinator uh, earlier in the uh, afternoon of the day in question. Okay, we do have our regular outreach event at Millennium Square in Pickering. Next one is this Friday evening, uh, the 20th, set up about 6 o'clock, running through until 11 p.m. And again, there will be a go or no-go decision uh, depending on the weather. Uh, 
Following uh, week on uh, Friday the 27th, we have the Mars Fest. And um, we're going to need a lot of people on deck for that. Uh, the last time we did a Mars opposition program, they had cars lined up north of Don Mills Road waiting to turn into the parking, uh, or north of Eglinton Avenue on Don Mills Road, waiting to turn into the parking lot. Had about 6,500 uh, people attend. So uh, again, if you can help out with that, we'd greatly appreciate it. And uh, it, if it's a clear night, it's going to be uh, a successful one, I think. Okay, uh, we do have a special event going on in mid-August, and it turns out that that's the weekend I'm the site supervisor on site. Uh, <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> this is going to be a busy weekend. Uh, what we're organizing is a uh, f joint fundraising event with the Bruce uh, Trail Volunteers, their Beaver Valley uh, group. Uh, so what we're going to have is guided hikes, uh, a choice of either a long hike or a short hike, uh, from uh, uh, various points along the Bruce Trail. Uh, we'll end up back at the CAO for uh, a barbecue with a potluck table, and then uh, a star talk in the evening, and then uh, whereas the Bruce Trail folks have done the uh, hikes, we're going to do the uh, evening uh, observing. And so um, uh, as a fundraiser, there's a participation of fee of uh, $15, but CAO fees are waived for that weekend uh, for people who are participating. Anyway, there will be more information on that on the website in due course. Uh, the other thing is that we've got uh, an astrophotography uh, or imaging workshop uh, the weekend of September 7th to 9th that's being set up. And again, there will be more details on this. It's a continuation of a, uh, an imaging workshop that was held last year, I believe. And uh, the idea is to use the new imaging observatory uh, at the CAO site, uh, which, uh, as you can see there, has uh, two uh, high-powered modern telescopes that uh, will make imaging uh, quite exciting. And uh, again, the usual arrangements for uh, booking space at the uh, CAO for that event. So again, more uh, information about that will be coming to you soon. Okay, so uh, again, there are other things going on at the CAO and uh, we encourage you to use the facility during the summer. Uh, you can get uh, loaner keys if you don't go up on a supervised weekend. And uh, again, you just have to book it online. Uh, of course, if there is a site supervisor there, uh, hopefully we will see the commissioning of this particular structure. This is the photograph I got today of the observatory, uh, which is uh, set up right next to our, uh, our big uh, public observing observatory up there. And you can see that the, uh, the roof is rolled back, all the hardware is in place to uh, support the roof on the, uh, the outriggers. And um, I guess the next step is just uh, wiring in the motor drive for that and a, a couple of other things and then we'll be able to put the telescope into place. So lots of things going on at the CAO site which uh, is again a really exciting thing going on and uh, a lot of the financial support for that I want to acknowledge Laura Chow and Sue Wheelband who in fact uh, jointly have uh, put up most of the money for the uh, building of that structure. Uh, of course, if you uh, don't have a telescope yet and want to try one out, I uh, do want to remind you that we also have our uh, telescope loan program, which is uh, no charge to members of the uh, Toronto Centre. And uh, let's see, I think I, yeah, Mark is up there and, and Peter, who are two of the three managers of the program. So again, if you're interested in this, they're here and they'll be happy to talk with you about uh, the equipment that is available. Okay, and finally, meeting after the meeting at the Granite Brew Pub, uh, convening as soon as we can get out of the building, and um, again, uh, bite to eat, parking uh, accessed off of Mount Pleasant, just south of Eglinton Avenue. Uh, yeah, you can get there despite the construction, and there'll be a few of us there this evening after the meeting concludes. So, I th uh, are there any other announcements? 
If not, thank you for coming tonight, and we'll see you again in mid-August. Have a safe trip home and enjoy the skies.